So newly digitized records shed groundbreaking new light on the Lincoln assassination that provides details that I think will shock a lot of you. Um, the story of Lincoln's assassination is full of intrigue, red herrings, and hidden motives that are now brought to light, uh, I think much of it for the first time in James Perloff's new book, Exploding the Official Myths of the Lincoln Assassination, on today's Tree of Liberty Society. Well, thank you for having me on, Ben, and I should just mention that um, a lot of the things I, I discuss in uh, this book, which the book is new, but... A lot of the things were actually known to Americans. Um, back in 1937, an author named Otto Eisenschimmel wrote, this is just a reprint, but read a book called Why Was Lincoln Murdered? I read that back in the 90s. but just wowed by it. The scholarship, the depth of his research, the archival research, um, his ability to find memoirs that nobody else could have found. And then he pulled that up with a book in 1940. You can't see the title. I can only get it in hardbound, but uh, it was called In the Shadow of Lincoln's Death. And uh, just to elaborate, uh, this um, early this year, I was thinking what my next blog post should should be. And I, back in the 90s, I'd read Eisenschimmel's book, but I never um, wrote anything about it. And I said, you know, this points, this man's great points still stay with me today. I mean, he just dismantled the whole uh, mainstream narrative. And then I found another author, uh, Don Thomas, who's written a couple of books, uh, The Reason Lincoln Had to Die and The Reason uh, Booth Had to Die. And uh, I've been in touch with him and he's been a tremendous help to me. Uh, he pointed out um, so much of uh, what Eisenschimmel had to find in, in library collections and on paper in the 1930s, now available in digitized format. You know, you can find the Lincoln assassination trial, but all the associated trials, the uh, impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson, uh, the trial of John Surratt, one of John Wilkes Booth's accomplices, so many books and memoirs, and even in magazines that were written in the 19th century are now available in digital format. You can actually word search them digitally, looking yeah. for a certain name, you know, just amazing. And it accelerated the research a great deal, but uh, I can't little, imagine uh, being a, an a old time researcher where you actually had to like dig through libraries and go through and have to read the whole thing to find the, the key details. Right. That's um, what I just, could do. With, yeah. With my, my first book, The Shadows of Power, which came out in 1988, I had to do that. There was no internet. And uh, so I went to libraries and if the library didn't have a book, I'd get an interlibrary loan, you know, yeah. have a slow process. No uh, and I made photocopies of pages that were interested to me and, um, but uh, I didn't have a word processor yet. That, that was just kind of coming on board. And I didn't get my first home PC until 1989 after mm -hmm. I'd written that book. So, yeah, that was much more laborious uh, process back then. But um, what I want to stress is a lot of what I'm saying was known to Americans in the 1930s when Eisenhower's book became a, a book of the month club selection. And, you know, by World War II, they had almost a million members in that club. And... Uh, and then in 1971, NBC television aired a documentary. It was an Emmy-nominated documentary on the Lincoln assassination, which also blew holes in the official story. I'm sure largely drawing on Eisenschimmel. And that was a first-class production um, made by Wolper Productions, which made North and South and Ritz and other um, miniseries. You'd be surprised that they were willing yeah. to put that out there to the mainstream public. Mm, they did. Mm. Um, but then... More information came out that Eisenhower didn't have access to the FBI's investigation of John Wilkes Booth's diary by their forensic laboratory, a lost confession, actually a destroyed confession that turned up in an attorney's papers by his descendants 110 years, uh, 112 years after the trial. There was more information that was out there that Don Thomas, the other guy I mentioned, had come across. And so my book is, it's new to this generation, but um, I say much of the information uh, would have been known to uh, folks in older generations, but now there's a really an unprecedented campaign to erase information, not just as it relates to current issues, right. like uh, some things I'm not going to mention on the air because to <laughs> they get you get your red strikes and your video <laughs> erased. But but your know, things like climate change, uh -huh. other things that uh, are presented as new normals, but um, also history. I found that there's uh, been a concerted attack, a coordinated attack on Eisenschimmel in his work, even though he was a magnificent scholar, he's now being ridiculed. 
And I said, you know, I, as I was writing this, what was going to be a blog post turned into a book. It was too 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 um oh wow too 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 long to be a blog post. Um, that's another the fact that uh, truth seekers of the past were being now being ruthlessly attacked. This goes along with the melting down of Confederate yeah. statues, the banning of the Confederate flag. They're erasing history, and part of the uh, history of the erasing is what really happened to Abraham Lincoln. I wanted to bring that back uh, to wonderful. the public. Well, let me let's I think this is a great that's a great teaser for what we're going to be getting into. But I want to uh, first kind of, you know, what what you said right there of the, you know, of the danger of getting strikes on YouTube. So what we'll do is I, I want to make sure you are not concerned of, you know, holding anything back. I want everybody to know what what, mm -hmm. what you know. And so what we'll do is if there is something like that that happens that, that you say, I'm like, oh, OK, that might get me a, a strike on YouTube. We'll do an unedited version that'll be at the tree of liberty society dot com. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that way, make sure that um, our viewers go there to watch the video. Um, if anything needs to be edited out for, you know, the reasons why they would cut you out, because there are definitely pushes to get channels deleted uh, for saying certain mm -hmm. things. But um, I've been reading your books for over 20 years now. I love them. Um, I want to give a little bit of a background for anybody that hasn't um, read any of your books. Uh, James Perloff has been a journalist since 1986 when he began writing for the New American Magazine. And some of uh, your previous books include uh, The Shadows of Power, which I love, uh, Tornado in a Junkyard about evolution, which is fantastic, Truth is a Lonely Warrior, uh, 13 Pieces of the Jigsaw, and Missing Saints, Missing Miracles, which I read that last one uh, a few months ago. Fabulous book. Encourage anybody to read it. Um, and you're a much sought after pod podcast guest and uh, you've been appeared on hundreds of radio shows and podcasts. So thank you so much, uh, James Perloff, for, for coming on today to talk about your new book. I have a copy as well. Encourage folks to get it. The link will be in the description of this video and nice. at the tree of liberty society.com. So, um, in, um, so there's a balance, right? What I want to do with going through this book of getting people, you know, interested enough to know why, why it's important to read this book without just giving so much information. Now they feel like there's no need to, right? <laughs> Cause I, I want folks to, to read the book, but I, I think the, this first paragraph in chapter 10 of the book is a really good teaser. It says um, it's, it asks questions, right? And I think really asking questions is just so vital to being able to come to the truth and weed through the propaganda that's out there. It says, why were prisoners hooded, denied the ability to communicate, and then by a kangaroo court, either hanged or sentenced to imprisonment on a desolate island? Why was Booth's diary concealed for two years, then many of its pages destroyed when subpoenaed by Congress? What was Stanton so uh, desperately trying to hide? It could only be evidence that would incriminate himself, the War Department, and or the radical Republicans they represented. I, I just love those questions. Uh, that you propose there. Um, the uh, And um, for a lot of our um, viewers, the and just people in modern society today in general, um, they when you say the word radical Republican, they they think you're giving an epithet. you're you're criticizing Republicans and you're calling them mm -hmm. radicals. But um, I'd like you to kind of just before we get into things, explain what a radical Republican was, that it's not what we it's not a you weren't name calling Republicans, that it was actually a group of, early Republicans. Uh, correct. And uh, it's interesting. And this is an important point. And it's one that I um, mentioned early in the book, um, because people will get confused. In the Lincoln's time, it was the Republicans, especially what they called radical Republicans, uh, people like Thaddeus Stevens, uh, Samuel Chase, um, um, uh, Ben Wade, um, uh, a number of others who were... Um, quite left wing, actually, and showed very little respect for the Constitution. And it was actually the Democrats in those days who were conservative. Now, over many decades, their positions have flipped. And so today, when you think of Republican, you uh, might think of was it Marjorie Taylor Greene or Rand Paul, people like that, and say, well, why are you criticizing the Republicans? Well, it was very different in those days. The people who rep really rep represented what we call the deep state and the left wing in those days were the Republicans. They have changed places. And that's just something to understand with the context of the of the Lincoln assassination. Yeah, it's really good. Um, it's really, yeah, we have to really understand the Marxist beginnings uh, of the Republican Party that really people don't understand. Um, another thing that I think is you know important for folks to understand about uh, about your book, too, is 
especially in the Liberty camp, you have people that are so staunchly in favor, you know, love Lincoln and just revere him. And then on the other side in, in within the Liberty movement, you have people that consider him to be a, a tyrant. Um, and there are some books that we'll put in that by uh, Thomas De Lorenzo that I highly recommend that explain mm -hmm. what Lincoln was really all about. And I think that in, it, it's one of those um, rare books that people from both perspectives will enjoy and appreciate because you're not, it's not this typical thing. Well, you know, the deep state was trying to kill Lincoln because he was turning against them, like is common amongst like what we've heard recently with, with Trump or with Reagan or with JFK as the, the so-called reasons behind it, the reasons behind it are much um, more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I, I think uh, it might be good for the audience that we just quickly reviewed what happened in Lincoln assassination, the mainstream account. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give a very condensed version because yeah. it won't be fresh in a lot of people's minds. minds. Um, uh, April the 9th, 1865, uh, General Robert E. Lee, the commander of the uh, forces of Army of Northern Virginia, surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, very famous event. Uh, he surrendered to General Ulysses S. Grant, future president. And uh, five days after that, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, went to Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., accompanied by his wife. And uh, uh, they were watching a play called Amer Our American Cousin. And um, at about 10, 15 that night during the third act, a very famous actor, John Wilkes Booth, Southern sympathizer, came into the box, shot Lincoln in the back of the head, mortally wounded him. He was never regained in consciousness. And uh, Booth uh, jumped onto the stage but he caught his spur on the American flag, ironically, which is decorating the legend. He broke his leg, and uh, but that didn't stop him from yelling the state motto of Virginia, six summer tyrannus, which means thus always to tyrants, and also the South is avenged. And then he split for the um, uh, rear wrenches of the theater, was able to get away on a horse, and he rode off south with a riding companion, an accomplice named David Harold. Now, Something a lot of people won't remember is there was a simultaneous assassination attempt on the Secretary of State, uh, William Seward, at his home. Now, Seward was bedridden from a recent serious carriage accident. But one of Booth's accomplices named Lewis Powell entered the home, stabbed Seward several times in his bed, and a uh, very bloody scene. He stabbed several other people trying to restrain him, including two of uh, Seward's sons. Um now, the doctors didn't think Seward was going to live, but he did. In the meantime, Booth is riding south, but that broken leg is really killing him. So he rides off his course several miles to the west, and he goes to the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd. This is in southern Maryland. Um, he knows Mudd slightly. Mudd reduces the fracture, makes a homemade cast, and as a neighbor, makes some um, crude crutches for Booth, who rests for a while, continues on. But he's really slowed down now by that leg. Can't walk on it, really. Um, although he uses his crutches. And finally, uh, 12 days after the assassination, April the 26th, uh, Booth is cornered in a barn with Harold by a, a Union Cavalry detachment. Harold surrendered, but Booth refused to come out. They set the barn on fire, and against orders, their orders to bring Booth back for trial, one of the soldiers fired through an opening in the barn, uh, mortally wounding Booth. Um, he lived for two to three hours after that. After this, Eight alleged Booth accomplices were tried by a military court, and all were found guilty. Four were hung, and four were sentenced to um, prison at hard labor, three three for life. Um, and uh, they were sent to the remotest prison in Madgeville. It was um, Fort Jefferson on Dry Tortugas, which is a set of islands west of Key West. I didn't even know there were islands west of Key West until I read this, but they were like out of the reach of the public or where anybody could talk to them. So either they were hung or they were uh, uh, placed out of reach. And again, they, while they were um, uh, waiting trial and when they went back to their prison cells uh, in solitary confinement during the trial, they had to wear hoods over their head in addition to being ha shackled and handcuffed. Um, so uh, that's kind of the, the basic mainstream account, but in the book, we ask all kinds of questions about this, pointing out many holes in the official story, um, questions that um, sometimes I can only ask and sometimes I can answer. I could actually go through a list of those questions if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be great. But uh, so, but before we get into that, I wanted to kind of, you talked about the 
the mainstream account of what happened. What's the mainstream mm. reason? Like, what's the motive? Oh, you would say that they would they, they would say that it? Booth Booth was doing this either out of vengeance, um, because angry about the South losing the war, or he thought that since not all Confederate troops had yet surrendered, that perhaps um, you know it's alleged they was actually going to try and wipe out the entire Lincoln cabinet, and building got Lincoln and Seward. Um, that perhaps his hope was to wipe out the the uh, Lincoln cabinet, throw the North into such confusion that the remaining Confederate forces in the field uh, would rally. Um, these are the two mainstream reasons that are given. And the book, I think, does a great job of showing why those don't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think this is a good time. Let's go into some of the questions that you think that, mm -hmm. you know, that are are brought up or important that you can answer. And, and then some ones that you're like, these are questions that need to be answered. Right. Um, so I'm just going to read off a list. It's actually my my blog, gamesperlif.net. Um, why on a dishonest pretext did War Secretary Edwin Stanton deny Abraham Lincoln the protection he requested at Ford's Theater? Why was Lincoln assigned a disreputable bodyguard who deserted his post shortly before the assassination? Why was the bodyguard not even reprimanded and his name virtually erased from history books? How did John Wilkes Booth know he only needed a one-shot Derringer to dispose of the president. Although many mainstream historians claim Booth and his accomplices intended to kill Lincoln's whole cabinet, why were the only actual assassination attempts made against the only two prominent men in the administration, Lincoln and Seward, who stood in the way of the brutal plan of reconstruction for the South, which had been devised by Stanton and the radical Republicans? In what ways was the presidential box at Ford's theater modified to facilitate the murder? Why did Washington's telegraph wires shut down right after the assassination? Why did War Secretary Stanton take charge of the investigation, which more properly fell under the Attorney General's jurisdiction? How did Booth and Harold escape Washington so easily via the guarded Navy Yard Bridge, even though there was an order to let no unauthorized person cross after 9 p.m., a curfew that had been in effect for more than two years that Booth surely knew about, as he often lived in Washington? Uh, why wasn't the sergeant who let the two men pass in violation of orders reprimanded? Why was the road that Booth and Harold took the only road that Stanton left unpatrolled? What did Booth tell Southerners was his real reason for leaving a card at the residence of Lincoln's new vice president, Andrew Johnson, on the day of the assassination? Secretary Seward's would-be assassin, Lewis Powell, gained access to the home by pretending to be a pharmacy delivery boy. He knew the name of Seward's physician, where the staircase was, where the... Seward's bedroom was on, on, on the third floor. He knew the exact layout of the house. Where did he get this inside information? Why were the soldiers closest to capturing Booth or at the halt? Well, at the cost of an extra day's time, a select detachment was organized by Stanton in Washington, including two commanders who, who were trusted associates of his right-hand man, Lafayette Baker. Why was the court-martial Sergeant Boston Corbett, who against orders allegedly shot Booth, canceled? Why was Booth's diary recovered from his body never introduced in evidence at the conspiracy trial? Why was it kept a secret for two years and when finally exposed was 43 sheets or 86 pages missing? Why were Booth's alleged accomplices denied a jury trial and disallowed defense counsel until approximately the proceedings began? It depended on, on the individual at the exact time. Uh, we've kind of touched on this, but why were they continually shackled with hoods over their heads before either being hanged or sentenced to the remote prison of dry tortugas? Why was Mary Surratt hanged the very day after a sentence was pronounced? Who was the snitch who lived in Mary Surratt's boarding house while simultaneously working in the War Department? And why did a court stenographer call him a perjurer? What demand did Stanton make of Mrs. Surratt's priest as a condition for being allowed to give her his final sacraments? What close friend of Booth, an actor who performed at Ford's Theater on the night of the assassination, was also old friends with William P. Wood, Stanton's intelligence chief? Booth was well known to carry a swagger stick in which he posed in 11 different photographs. What inscription, perhaps relevant to the assassination, was engraved on its gold-plated handle? And finally, when Edwin Stanton was on his deathbed, visions of what person did he say haunted him day and night, such that he said he could not live under the pressure that he was bearing? Wow. Now, there's other questions asked by the book, but these are some of them. And uh, a lot of questions few, few, that don't, yeah, fewer raised, the fewer raised doesn't by, put together, right? Yeah, fewer of these questions are raised by mainstream historians. Yeah, wow. So, kind of getting back to some of the, the, the motives that are out there, right? That uh, people talk about. One motive that I've heard that um, I don't subscribe to, but I wanted to get your response to was that 
he was trying to, you know, get rid of the national bank. I mean, not get rid of, get rid of like a, make it a national bank where the, it was instead of a, like a federal reserve that was going on, he was just trying to do a debt free uh, notes. And that's why the insiders wanted to get rid of him. Um, yeah, I've, um, um, that is uh, one of the uh, theories about this. Um, actually, the Rothschilds had a um, their top financial agent in the North at the time was named August Belmont. And uh, he did offer, uh, according to reports, uh, loans to Lincoln to finance the war at high interest. And uh, there's even a story, and it may be apocryphal, I don't know if it's true or not, that Lincoln literally had him thrown out of the White House um, at this demand. Um the South had its Rothschild people too, particularly Judah P. Benjamin was said to be, um, he held several cabinet positions during the war and he fled to Europe after the war and he was said to be a Rothschild agent too. But um, Lincoln, uh, rather than taking loans, he created what they called greenbacks, which was government um, created money, which would be the constitutional way to make money. And the advantage of greenbacks is although they generated inflation by printing money, they did not come with the cost of debt. There was no debt on them, whereas the Federal Reserve notes still to this day. Um, but it still Fed wasn't constitutional money, because it wasn't backed by gold or silver. Right. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, the greenbacks, um, um, uh, the, the contrast I was going to put to the Federal Reserve today, it creates money out of nothing, causing right. inflation. But in addition to that, it exchanges those uh, Federal Reserve created dollars for uh, federal treasury notes, which are then sold on the open market. And that puts us further and further into debt. So Lincoln was creating a system of creating money that caused inflation, but not debt. But some people have also criticized Lincoln for creating the greenbacks in as much as um, they feel that it created a the possibility of creating money out of nothing. And that in turn could be um, taken advantage of by war profiteers who now had access to funds that normally uh, would not be uh, granted them through taxation. Some people also think that even the greenbacks were sort of a banker's plot. But yeah, that's definitely been said. And I've seen a quotation. I have to go back. <laughs> I haven't seen it for a long time. I have to go back and find it, that there was um, some banker who um, swore vengeance or implied as much on Lincoln for not accepting loans. Uh, but whether or not that would be the reason for the assassination, I don't know. My book is more of an, a forensic exam examination of the of the assassination as well as the people in the u.s government were closest to um um the people carrying out the assassination but uh without a doubt those people in turn did represent a deep state um that was in existence at that time and of course the connections sure. you not find them in writing but you can draw uh some logical uh educated guesses about them and so i think that that kind of creates this contradiction in people's minds that have studied into Lincoln and his, you know, tyrannical uh, tenure as president of the United States of why would the conspiracy want to get rid of him if he was, he was a part of the radical Republicans, you know, he was definitely, you know, Marxists for decades to come up even in the 1900s. Um, you have the, the Marxist uh, Abraham Lincoln brigade. Um, why, right. why mm -hmm. would they want to get rid of him? Um, if he was basically a part of their team and, um, you know, was was making sure that uh, declarations of independence could never happen again within the United States. Right. Um, why would the conspiracy want to get rid of him? Um, right. Um, and uh, the short answer to that is he was the lesser of the evils. Um, uh, as, I, as I touched on, uh, Lincoln uh, was opposed to the brutal plan of reconstruction. The South had really been devastated by the Civil War. Uh, you've heard of Sherman's March to the Sea. And they burned down Atlanta. They burned down um, Charleston. They burned down Savannah. They uh, just destroyed Petersburg and Richmond up in Virginia. And they stole crops. Um, what they didn't steal, they burned. And um, the South was just left, less devastated. Uh, but there were people who wanted now to treat the South as the radical republic wanted to treat it as a conquered um, country. They, they they themselves would use that that phrase. And Lincoln was against that. Lincoln felt there had been enough bloodshed, more than half a million soldiers had been killed during the war. So many people widowed and orphaned by it. And um, this, he felt the South had been punished enough. He did not want it ec economic exploitation, which is what happened. You know, the carpetbaggers from the North came down. They placed onerous taxation on 
um, Southern properties, thousands of people lost their homes. And you might remember him gone with the wind when um, uh, Scala Hera goes to uh, Rhett Butler to beg him for the money she needs to pay taxes on her property, Tara. Um, that kind of thing was really happening. Um, cotton, countless bales of cotton were, were stolen. And uh, the, the South is just brutally uh, treated. And they were under military occupation. They couldn't vote for their own governors. Uh, for 12 years, what they called Reconstruction, they were ruled by the War Department's appointed military governors. They could not vote for their own leaders. Um, and this is one reason all this brutal Reconstruction period, many women were raped, black and white alike. And uh, you know, th that's, this is one reason why the Southerners resented the Yankees for so long was the treatment they got under Reconstruction. They're already defeated and now things were made even worse. But Lincoln didn't want to do that. Lincoln wanted the Southern states to... They'd be voting again. He wanted them to be restored to Congress. And the radical Republicans were against that because they knew that the combination of Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats would outvote them in Congress. They would then lose their power, as would the deep state be who was behind them. So uh, Lincoln uh, wanted a very gentle reconciliation. And again, it was a saying, the only prominent member of his cabinet who agreed with him on this was Seward. And it was only Lincoln and Seward that were assassination attempts were made on on that night. Now they tried to say they were going to have to Grant and Johnson and Stanton and others, but those somehow those all fell through. The the uh, case I make in my book is no, they got the two they wanted. They got the two they wanted, and this opened the door for the reconstruction and the subjugation of the South. This is really what they were after. I do, as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll do this. Um, I just want to quote uh, some things. The South was not happy about Lincoln's death because they, they knew that it meant that they were now going to be subject to what they called Reconstruction. And Jefferson Davis said, quote, it will be disastrous for our people. Just talking about the assassination. Um, it, the assassin was condemned by Robert E. Lee, by the by the Southern newspapers. And many years ago, I had to go back and find this book. I, um, uh, back in the 90s, I read a book uh, by Sarah Morgan Dawson, who lived down in um, New Orleans. She wrote uh, a book that was called A Confederate Girl's Diary. 440 pages long. I never forgot the closing words. I went back to make sure that I got them right. She said, quote, our Confederacy is gone with one crash, the report of the pistol fired at Lincoln, end quote. Now, down south, people understood that they were going to be blamed for the assassination and that Reconstruction would be made even worse by it. But listen to what radical uh, Congressman George Julian said in his diary. Now, he wrote this on April the 15th. Lincoln died in the morning of the 15th, and now they're already holding a political caucus. And here's what he wrote in his diary, quote, I like the radicalism of the members of this caucus, but not in a long time have I heard so much profanity, it became intolerably disgusting. Their hostility towards Lincoln's policy of conciliation and contempt for his weakness were undisguised. And the universal feeling among radical men here is that his death is a godsend. It really seems so for among the last acts of his official life was an invitation to some of the chief rebel conspirators to meet in Richmond and confer with us on the subject of peace, end quote. So here you see the Iraq Republicans virtually celebrating Lincoln's death while in the South, they are very terrified as to what the assassination means. This is quite a contrast to uh, the common conception, but it, it yep. was the reality at that time. Yep. So was Andrew Johnson more in favor of just the, just mowing down the south or is that why he wasn't kind of a part of the the overall plot or yes and but he evolved over time um uh he originally was in favor of the radical republican plan and that's why he they allowed him to become uh, vice president and he was not assassinated over time however he had increasing conflicts with stanton whom he ultimately fired and um Actually, the reason for his impeachment trial was that he fired Stanton. Stanton refused to be fired. He actually barricaded himself in the War Department for months. He, he actually lived there behind barricades, behind soldiers, while his radical Republican friends in Congress tried to impeach Johnson. They failed by one vote, and that was the end of Stanton. But in the beginning, he went along with the radical Republican plan of of uh, Reconstruction, but he gradually softened over time. He saw the kind of people he was dealing with. He was actually a Democrat. Um from the South, he was a new vice president for, for Lincoln. He had not been Lincoln's first vice president during his first term, but because Lincoln was getting unpopular in 1864, uh, people were sick of the war. Uh, there was a real concern that his opponent, the Democrat 
former General George McClellan was going to win. So they needed a Democrat on the ticket and they picked Johnson. Gradually, he turned against the plan of reconstruction. He wanted to, um, he started vetoing the more severe measures and they wanted to get rid of him. He started out in uh, in uh, coherence with their plan, but eventually turned against it. And then they turned on him. So they had already changed, right? Because with in the original um, days of, of the union, um, it was the person that won second place for president became vice president. But by this time, the presidents were had a running mate. And that, that, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. But yeah, he was his running mate. He, was uh, running he did mate. not okay. uh, run for president and win second place. That gotcha. actually would be a kind of an interesting way to do things. It kind of makes, two, you know, that way you were speaking would make it um, a, a situation where compromises would have to work. That kind of a balance of power thing, really. Right. Yeah. Uh, that. In, in retrospect, I'm just thinking of it now. I haven't thought of it, but it sounds like a, it was a pretty good plan yeah. um, to start with. Um, but uh, yeah, Johnson was actually uh, Lincoln's running mate. running mate, but he really couldn't run for, for re-election in 1868 because after all, he was a Democrat and he, couldn't har- he could hardly stand as the uh, Republican nominee <laughs> at right. that time. So why do you think that when, uh, instead of assassinating Johnson, why did they go, why did they try the impeachment route? Instead, uh, again, thinking. because he had, he had fired Stanton. Uh, the reason he fired Stanton was, um, well, there were a couple of things that happened. One thing he found that Stanton was spying on him. Um, and um, the other reason uh, was that uh, the woman who was hung, uh, Mary Surratt, um, the judges did not want to hang her. The military uh, commissioners did not want to hang her. Uh, but Joseph Holt was working for Stanton, said very slyly, well, tell you what, let's give her the death penalty, but we'll send Andrew Johnson a um, appeal for mercy. Well, that Johnson never saw that appeal. Now, there's always been controversy about this. Stanton insisted he did see it, and Johnson said he never did. During this trial of Murray Surratt's son, two years later, Johnson himself read the newspapers about this appeal for mercy. He said, I've never seen that. So he sent for the findings of the original trial. And, and when he saw that he had not seen the appeal for mercy and that an innocent woman had been hung as a result, he was enraged with Stanton. He sent him a one sentence uh, um, letter of dismissal. But again, Stanton refused to be dismissed and he insisted that uh, his friends in Congress try to impeach Johnson so he could stay in power. This is really what was going on at that time. Um, so that that's the basic uh, the basic explanation was he found out that he uh, had, was supposed to give her a, a a potential appeal for mercy and he was not shown that the judges at the trial wanted him to receive the appeal he said he never saw it right okay so I really don't want to get give away too much and so I want to just um, go into just one last story and then mm-hmm. encourage everyone to read your book. Go get your book on uh, Amazon. Is it the best place to go, or would you rather go to your website? Uh, they could get it at Amazon. Uh, I I only have the time to pack up a lot of individual orders and build them myself. So yeah. I prefer people to go to the Amazon, even though Amazon is you know exactly. problematic in of itself. But people can also buy it. By the way, there's a ministry down in Texas called Power of Prophecy. It's a truth ministry. They have the book in stock. If people don't want to go to Amazon, okay. and there's another ministry that's going to um, start stocking it too, but they don't have it have it yet at this time. Gotcha. Um, but um, yeah, go ahead with that. Um, I'll put links in the that, description. Yeah. But um, what's as we wrap up? What is a story that's in the book that you think is just like is is something that people haven't heard and just something that just kind of blew you away as you were as you wanted to add it to the book? I, I think the most powerful thing is the. Uh, destruction of uh and hiding of john Wilkes booth's diary you know um yeah, yeah. <laughs> they entered some all this stuff that uh they found on john Wilkes booth they uh entered into evidence at the conspiracy trial of his eight alleged accomplices including his knife his pistols his belt his holster his file his compass his spurs his tobacco pipe his carbon cartridges and bills of exchange but what about his diary i mean I mean, when there's a, <laughs> a mass when his mass shooting don't they print the manifesto of the alleged shooter right so this diary, which is found on Booth, which is given directly to Stanton, uh, Lafayette Baker is um, um, head of the Secret Service, also flipped through it before handing it over to, to Stanton. But it's kept secret for two years, not introduced at the trial. And the only reason that um, the diary even became known about was that 
Stan had a break with the head of the Secret Service and fired him. That was Lafayette Baker. So Lafayette Baker went rogue. He published his own book called The History of the Secret Service. And for the first time, public in the Congress learned that John Wilkes Booth had a diary. People were shocked. And they asked the chief prosecutor, Joseph Holt, who knew all about the diary, why didn't you introduce this in evidence? He said, well, I didn't think it was relevant, which is ridiculous. It was pure obstruction mm -hmm. of justice. Pure obstruction of justice. So Congress sub subpoenaed that diary. And um, what they found was, um, well, I'm just going to quote uh, Congressman uh, Benjamin Butler. They found that many pages were missing. Here's what he said in 1867. He said, quote, that diary is now produced as 18 pages cut out the pages prior to the time when Abraham Lincoln was massacred, although the edges show they'd been written over. Who spoliated that book? Who caused an innocent woman to be hung? And there's more I can give you, Butler, but that, that, that's kind of satisfactory. But here's the thing that's really mind-blowing is that in 1977, 110 years after he made that those remarks, the FBI's forensic laboratory was asked by the National Park Service to do a thorough exam of the diary. And what they found was there wasn't 18 pages missing. It was 43 sheets or 86 pages had been removed, including the immediate 27 pages before the day of the assassination. Uh, and you could tell that these were not blank pages because on the edges, you could still see fragments of Booth's handwriting. So these were not blank pages. And um, also the pages from the time after the assassination, they found had been unbound then select pages reinserted. And that's what you see when you go online, read Don, John Wilkes Booth diary. You're looking at a tiny fragment of what was originally in it. Um, the pages were glued back in and rebound. Well, to be rebound, it has to be unbound. Obviously John Wilkes Booth was fleeing in a swamp, did not do this. This is done in the War Department. It's obvious that the people who kept the diary a secret for two years are also the ones who removed the, the vital contents before handing it over to Congress. And that's the War Department. That's Stanton. I think that's, obstruction of justice is the most powerful piece of evidence against the war department which we now call the defense department right but um not say that our defense department guys have anything to do with lincoln but um that is i think the single uh thing that is most undeniable in terms of guilt um just just uh the the concealment of, of vital vital information as as congressman butler uh asked how can boost tobacco by be considered relevant to introduce as evidence and not as a diary. It makes no <laughs> sense. The official mainstream narrative, they'll try to tell you Booth himself took out those pages. He couldn't have done it and put select pages back in. He couldn't have. Um, the, so the story is the yeah, the government had a lot to do with it. And it's obviously not the only time we've been lied to by the government in many scenarios, whether they're talking about the Spanish-American War or the Second Lusitania or the Korean War or Tonkin Gulf or the Iraq, we've been lied to many in weapons of mass destruction, right? We've been lied yeah. to many times by the government. But the Lincoln assassination, because the facts have been forgotten over the years, I really felt this generation needs to hear about the Lincoln Absolutely. assassination again. There are other books that deal with it, but um, for my money, the books that best deal with it prior to mine are Don Thomas's books and Otto Eisenschimmel's, but they don't get uh, much attention these days. So I'm just trying to bring back to the public uh, awareness, uh, some of these forgotten facts, as well as some new ones that uh, people have not heard of or, or thought about. That's wonderful. That's an interesting thing too, because of the the so-called co-conspirators that were tried um, and convicted, they weren't allowed to have a trial by jury. And then mm -hmm. others that were likely actual would-be co-conspirators, nothing ever happened to them. And so I, I like that right. you bring that information out in the book as well that folks can read if they get a copy, if they order their copy of the Exploding the Official Myths of the Lincoln Assassination. I appreciate uh, you joining us, Mr. Perloff. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ben, for having me on. It's, it's a pleasure and you've asked some great questions and great opportunity to uh, elaborate on this uh, crime that was, it was a crime to kill Lincoln, but there were a lot of other concealed crimes that people didn't right. know about associated with it. And we'll put a link to your website in the description oh. of the video mm -hmm. and on our website at Tree of Liberty Society uh, dot com. Uh, but until I uh, appreciate that, I hope to be able to have you on again soon. We'll see you next time. OK, thanks so much. Mm -hmm.